So we do a walkthrough for the depth in chemistry from June 2017. So question one, we start off with ionic bonding. So what is an ionic bond? This is a definition you need to know. Electrostatic attraction between oppositely charged ions. Uh, then your dot and cross diagram for barium oxide. They've given you the formula. Uh, barium of course is in group two, so it's going to be two plus oxygen in group six, so two minus. And just make sure that you um, show the barium electrons different in a different shape to the oxygen electrons. I've chosen circles. So calculate the number of barium ions in 1.5 grams of barium oxide. Um, and they've asked for three significant figures. So you work out your moles of barium oxide, which is just mass over molar mass. To find the number of barium 2 plus ions, well, for every one barium oxide, there's one barium ion in there. So the moles of barium ions will be the same. And then to find the number of barium ions, you times that the moles by Avogadro's constant to give you 5.89 times 10 to the 21. And then um, just on this page, barium chloride is soluble in water. Compare the electrical conductivities of solid and aqueous barium chloride. Well, barium chloride solid will not conduct because the ions are in fixed positions. But as you'll remember, barium chloride, when dissolved in water, will conduct because the ions can now move. So describe the use of aqueous barium chloride in qualitative analysis. I hope you remember we use barium chloride uh, to test for sulfate ions. And if sulfate ions are present, we will see a white precipitate of barium sulfate. So how can I work out the number of water molecules in hydrated barium chloride? So it tells me the molar mass has been 244.3. So if I take that number and I take away the MR of barium chloride, which is 208.3, I'm left with 36. So the molar mass of water in there must be 36. The molar mass of one water molecule uh, is 18. So 36 divided by 18 gives me 2. So x equals 2. Complete the electronic configuration of the nitride ion. So nitride is going to be N3 minus. So you, nitrogen, of course, ends in 2P3. It's gained three electrons, so it's going to be 2P6. So you wouldn't have come across this equation before, but you should be able to work it out. I start with solid barium nitride and I react it with water and I form an alkaline solution and an alkaline gas. So what could they be? Well, the alkaline solution is like to be barium hydroxide and the gas where well, you've got nitrogen and you've got hydrogens present in the reaction. So that's going to be ammonia. And I pop the equation uh, there for you. So how can we carry out this experiment and process the results graphically? So I've done the mole calculations here for you. So first of all, I need to collect 72 centimetres cubed of hydrogen. So that is 0 0.003 moles of hydrogen. Moles of zinc will be the same. Um, I put the equation at the bottom of the page uh, here. Um, and as you can see, uh, one mole of hydrogen is produced by one mole of zinc. So that's the same. So mass of zinc, I times it by 65.4, which is a relative atomic mass of zinc, to give 0 0.20 grams. So that's the minimum mass of zinc I need, because it does say I need an excess of zinc. So my minimum is 0 0.20 grams. Um, how about uh, HCl? Well, um, I need uh, 0 0.006 moles of HCl because it is a 1 to 2 reaction. Um, and uh, let's say I'm going to use 0 0.1 mole per decimeter cubed HCl. That's a reasonable concentration of HCl to use. Um, so I can calculate my volume as being moles divided by concentration times 1,000 to give me 60 centimeters cubed. Now you've got to choose a sensible concentration of HCl um, because uh, you you notice it's a uh, um, a uh, you, you know you, your your conical flask is not going to be huge, so you can't have a massive volume. Um, oh, and also you've only got a hundred centimeter cube measuring cylinder, 
so the volume of HCl must be less than 100 centimeters cubed. So if it was really dilute, it would be too much. Um, and also, if you're using 100 centimeters cubed, you want it to be uh, not too small. So say if you calculate it was only 20, so you use a higher concentration, you would then obviously be using maybe a 50 centimeters cubed measuring cylinder rather than a 100. Okay. Um, and then finally, how would you, well, let's look at the method. So you'd measure the mass of zinc um, and measure the volume of HCl, mix the zinc and acid in the flask, and then measure the gas volume at time, uh, at time intervals. You could then plot a graph of volume against time, draw a tangent at t equals zero, and the gradient of your tangent is the initial rate. And you work out the gradient by the volume divided by the time. So a bit of physical chemistry now. And um, I want to calculate the enthalpy change of combustion of hexane. So first of all, you work out the energy produced, which is going to be your mass of water times specific heat capacity times temperature change. Um, that will give you a value in joules, and you've got to convert that into kilojoules. Moles of hexane, I've worked out there. And then it's just your energy divided by moles. Uh, remembering, of course, it's an exothermic reaction, so it's a minus sign. And you only want it to three significant figures uh, because um, you've got your all of these to three sig fig. So to three sig fig, three sig fig is minus 2510 kilojoules per mole. The calculated value uh, from this experiment is different from the data book value. Why could that be? Well, um, various reasons. Could be incomplete combustion during the experiment. Um, probably wasn't standard conditions either. And heat could be released to the surroundings as well. So those are three reasons. Okay, so now we're going to plot these values. They've done the first three and I've marked the uh, point for butane. And what you would then do is you would draw a straight line through those points um uh because you need to work out uh the value for um pentane which is coming on the next page so if you do that you'll get a value for pentane as being around about minus three five five zero kilojoules your moles of pentane that uh, you have been given is 1.80 grams uh, molar mass of pentane 72, so that gives you 0 0.0250 moles of pentane. So the energy that be released by that number of moles, well, one mole releases minus 3550. So you need to times that by the number of moles you actually have and to give you the energy released as being minus 88.75. So we've got a HES cycle now. So notice with your HES cycle, you have been given formation data. To use the formation cycle uh, with the elements down the bottom there. Um, if you have a look as you do your circle, these two arrows, this one and this one, are going in a clockwise direction, whereas this arrow here is going in an anti clockwise direction. So, therefore, these two must add up to this one here. So, I pop that in the equation down here, and you should get a delta H value of minus 3919.5. So a nice diagram of hydrogen bond in there um, between a methanol molecule and water molecule. Key things, obviously label your dipoles up as I've done and make sure that your lone, your hydrogen bond ends on a lone pair of electrons on your oxygen atom. Right, okay, so um, giving me alcohol C now and I'm going to name it. So let's have a look. What's my longest chain? Well, that's four carbons long. So butan 2O. And on carbon number three, there's a methyl group. So three methyl butan 2O. Unfortunately, this has been removed, but I've put the values X of 45 and Y is 88 is your M over Z value. Um, so your two ions for X and Y I've shown there. Um, don't forget your plus charges on your ions. Okay, so now we're going to move on 
to um, oxidation of butane 1 -ol. So obviously you remember you can do a partial oxidation where you will form the aldehyde, in this case butane L, or you can do a full oxidation where you reflux um, to form butanoic acid. I've put the equation there and a very simplistic diagram of how you would carry out the distillation. Right, so question five, propanoic acid. Uh, general formula for carboxylic acid, well, um, you have double the number of hydrogens for each carbon and always two oxygens, so I put that there. What's gonna be the shape around a carbon atom here? Well, it's gonna be tetrahedral because uh, you've got four bonded pairs which repel equally. And what about around this? Well, you've got an oxygen atom which is gonna have two bonding pairs, two non-bonding pairs, and therefore it's going to be 104.5. Okay, unfortunately, again, this was uh, removed, so I've drawn a very basic uh, IR there um, and labelled the peaks. So if you'd seen it, you would have a clear one for OH and for C double bond O. So, you know, um, it tells you it's a structural isomer of propanoic acid. So it isn't a um, acid, uh, carboxylic acid. So you need to have a carbonyl and an uh, a alcohol group there. And I've drawn the three possible isomers you could have there. Right, okay, so we now have free radical substitution. Um, they've told me that there, so free radical substitution, you need UV radiation. Overall reaction, remember you substitute a hydrogen for a halogen and make the hydrogen halide, which I've shown there. What type of fission is homolytic fission? And that's because one electron from each of the chlorine, uh, from the chlorine-chlorine bond, goes to each of the chlorine atoms. Uh, so how do we do this? Well, uh, chlorine free radical is gonna come along here and it's gonna take off a hydrogen here uh, to give me a free radical here in HCl and then this free radical reacts with Cl2 to give me my product and another chlorine free radical. Where must that uh, unpaired electron be? Well, it must be on that middle carbon there because that's where the chlorine goes. And another possible isomer, well, you know, you can have multiple substitution. I've just put a chlorine here. Um, however, you could have um, a chlor you could have put that chlorine there, there, or there. It doesn't matter. Right, so last question. Uh, first of all, an intermediate E. Well, you've reacted a halogeno alkane with NaOH aqueous, so you're going to make an alcohol there. Um, and how do you do step two? Well, you've taken a alcohol and made an alkene. So that is phosphoric acid, catalyst, and heat. Um, percentage yield, quite nice. So moles of cyclohexene is just mass over the molar mass. Moles of uh, uh, bromocyclohexane, um, again, mass over molar mass. And then it's just one over tubber to give you 44.4%. And we end with a nice mechanism. This is just electrophilic addition. The only thing that's going to uh, worry you a little bit, of course, is it's a cyclo compound, but don't worry about it. Um, just go with, go with what you know. Um, so you have the double bond, uh, the electrons from the double bond attacking the delta plus bromine. The bromine bromine bond breaking to give you a bromide ion, which will attack the carbocation as the intermediate. Okay, that's it.